Section One of Tanglewood Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. Tanglewood Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Minotaur, Part One. The Minotaur. In the old city of Trezine. At the foot of a lofty mountain, there lived a very long time ago a little boy named Theseus. His grandfather, King Pythias, was the sovereign of that country, and was reckoned a very wise man. So that Theseus, being brought up in the royal palace and being naturally a bright lad, could hardly fail of profiting by the old king's instructions. His mother's name was Aethra. As for his father, the boy had never seen him. But from his earliest remembrance, Aethra used to go with little Theseus into a wood, and sit down upon a moss-grown rock which was deeply sunken into the earth. Here she often talked with her son about his father, and said that he was called Aegeus, and that he was a great king, and ruled over Attica, and dwelt at Athens, which was as famous a city as any in the world. Theseus was very fond of hearing about King Aegeus. And often asked his good mother Aethra why he did not come and live with them at Trezine. Ah, my dear son," answered Aethra with a sigh, "a monarch has his people to take care of. The men and women over whom he rules are in the place of children to him, and he can seldom spare time to love his own children as other parents do. Your father will never be able to leave his kingdom for the sake of seeing his little boy." Well, but dear mother," asked the boy, "why cannot I go to this famous city of Athens and tell King Aegeus that I am his son?" "You are but a tiny boy as yet," replied his brother. "See if you can lift this rock on which we are sitting." The little fellow had a great opinion of his own strength, so grasping the rough protuberances of the rock, he tugged and toiled amain and got himself quite out of breath without being able to stir the heavy stone. It seemed to be rooted into the ground. No wonder he could not move it, for it would have taken all the force of a very strong man to lift it out of its earthy bed. His mother stood looking on with a sad kind of smile on her lips and in her eyes to see the zealous and yet puny efforts of her little boy. She could not help being sorrowful at finding him already so impatient to begin his adventures in the world. You see how it is, my dear Theseus," said she. You must possess far more strength than now before I can trust you to go to Athens and tell King Aegeus that you are his son. But when you can lift this rock and show me what is hidden beneath it, I promise you my permission to depart. Often and often after this did Theseus ask his mother whether it was yet time for him to go to Athens, and still his mother pointed to the rock and told him that for years to come he could not be strong enough to move it. And again and again, the rosy-cheeked and curly-headed boy would tug and strain at the hard mass of stone, striving, child as he was, to do what a giant could hardly have done without taking both of his hands to the task. Meanwhile, the rock seemed to be sinking farther and farther into the ground. The moss grew over it thicker and thicker until at last it looked almost like a soft green seat with only a few grey knobs of granite peeping out. The overhanging trees also shed their brown leaves upon it as often as the autumn came, and at its base grew ferns and wild flowers, some of which crept quite over its surface. To all appearance, the rock was as firmly fastened as any other portion of the earth's substance. But difficult as the matter looked, Theseus was now growing up to be such a vigorous youth that, in his own opinion, the time would quickly come when he might hope to get the upper hand of this ponderous lump of stone. Mother, I do believe it has started," cried he after one of his attempts. "The earth around it is certainly a little cracked." "No, no, child," his mother hastily answered. "It is not possible you can have moved it. Such a boy as you still are." Nor would she be convinced, although Theseus showed her the place where he fancied that the stem of a flower had been partly uprooted by the movement of the rock. But Aethra sighed and looked disquieted, 
for no doubt she began to be conscious that her son was no longer a child, and that in a little while hence she must send him forth among the perils and troubles of the world. It was not more than a year afterwards when they were again sitting on the moss-covered stone. Aethra had once more told him the oft-repeated story of his father, and how gladly he would receive Theseus at his stately palace, and how he would present him to his courtiers and the people, and tell them that here was the heir of his dominions. The eyes of Theseus glowed with enthusiasm, and he would hardly sit still to hear his mother speak. "'Dear mother Aethra,' he exclaimed, "'I never felt half so strong as now. I am no longer a child, nor a boy, nor a mere youth. I feel myself a man. It is now time to make one earnest trial to remove the stone.' "'Ah, my dearest Theseus,' replied his mother, "'not yet, not yet.' "'Yes, mother,' said he resolutely, the time has come. Then Theseus bent himself in good earnest to the task, and strained every sinew with manly strength and resolution. He put his whole brave heart into the effort. He wrestled with the big and sluggish stone as if it had been a living enemy. He heaved, he lifted, he resolved now to succeed or else to perish there, and let the rock be his monument for ever. Aethra stood gazing at him, and clasped her hands, partly with a mother's pride and partly with a mother's sorrow. The great rock stirred. Yes, it was raised slowly from the bedded moss and earth, uprooting the shrubs and flowers along with it, and was turned upon its side. Theseus had conquered. While taking breath, he looked joyfully at his mother, and she smiled upon him through her tears. Yes, Theseus, she said, the time has come and you must stay no longer at my side. See what King Aegeus, your royal father, left for you beneath the stone when he lifted it in his mighty arms and laid it on the spot whence you have now removed it. Theseus looked and saw that the rock had been placed over another slab of stone, containing a cavity within it, so that it somewhat resembled a roughly made chest or coffer, of which the upper mass had served as the lid. Within the cavity lay a sword with a golden hilt and a pair of sandals. "'That was your father's sword,' said Aethra, "'and those were his sandals. "'When he went to be king of Athens, "'he bade me treat you as a child "'until you should prove yourself a man "'by lifting this heavy stone. "'That task being accomplished, "'you are to put on his sandals "'in order to follow in your father's footsteps "'and to gird on his sword.' so that you may fight giants and dragons, as King Aegeus did in his youth. "'I will set out for Athens this very day!' cried Theseus. But his mother persuaded him to stay a day or two longer, while she got ready some necessary articles for his journey. When his grandfather, the wise king Pythias, heard that Theseus intended to present himself at his father's palace, he earnestly advised him to get on board of a vessel and go by sea, because he might thus arrive within fifteen miles of Athens without either fatigue or danger. "'The roads are very bad by land,' quoth the venerable king, "'and they are terribly infested with robbers and monsters. A mere lad like Theseus is not fit to be trusted on such a perilous journey all by himself. No, no, let him go by sea.' But when Theseus heard of robbers and monsters, he pricked up his ears, and was so much the more eager to take up the road along which they were to be met with. On the third day, therefore, he bade a respectful farewell to his grandfather, thanking him for all his kindness, and affectionately embracing his mother, he set forth with a good many of her tears glistening on his cheeks, and some, if the truth must be told, that had gushed out of his own eyes. But he let the sun and wind dry them, and walked stoutly on, playing with the golden hilt of his sword, and taking very manly strides in his father's sandals. I cannot stop to tell you hardly any of the adventures that befell Theseus on the road to Athens. It is enough to say that he quite cleared that part of the country of the robbers about whom King Pythias had been so much alarmed. One of these bad people was named Procrustes, and he was indeed a terrible fellow, and had an ugly way of making fun of the poor travellers who happened to fall into his clutches. In his cavern he had a bed, 
on which, with great pretense of hospitality, he invited his guests to lie down. But, if they happened to be shorter than the bed, this wicked villain stretched them out by main force, or, if they were too tall, he lopped off their heads or feet, and laughed at what he had done as an excellent joke. Thus, however weary a man might be, he never liked to lie in the bed of Procrustes. Another of these robbers, named Skynus, must likewise have been a great scoundrel. He was in the habit of flinging his victims off a high cliff into the sea, and in order to give him exactly his deserts, Theseus tossed him off the very same place. But, if you will believe me, the sea would not pollute itself by receiving such a bad person into its bosom. Neither would the earth, having once got rid of him, consent to take him back, so that, between the cliff and the sea, Skynus stuck fast in the air, which was forced to bear the burden of his naughtiness. After these memorable deeds, Theseus heard of an enormous sow, which ran wild and was the terror of all the farmers round about. And as he did not consider himself above doing any good thing that came in his way, he killed this monstrous creature, and gave the carcass to the poor people for bacon. The great sow had been an awful beast while ramping about the woods and fields, but was a pleasant object enough when cut up into joints and smoking on I know not how many dinner tables. Thus, by the time he reached his journey's end, Theseus had done many valiant feats with his father's golden-hilted sword, and had gained the renown of being one of the bravest young men of the day. His fame travelled faster than he did, and reached Athens before him. As he entered the city, he heard the inhabitants talking at the street corners, and saying that Hercules was brave, and Jason too, and Castor, and Pollux likewise, but that Theseus, the son of their own king, would turn out as great a hero as the best of them. Theseus took longer strides on hearing this, and fancied himself sure of a magnificent reception at his father's court, since he came thither with fame to blow her trumpet before him, and to cry to King Aegeus, Behold your son! He little suspected, innocent youth that he was, that here in this very Athens where his father reigned, a greater danger awaited him than any which he had encountered on the road. Yet this was the truth. You must understand that the father of Theseus, though not very old in years, was almost worn out with the cares of government, and had thus grown aged before his time. His nephews, not expecting him to live a very great while, intended to get all the power of the kingdom into their own hands. But when they heard that Theseus had arrived in Athens, and learned what a gallant young man he was, they saw that he would not be at all the kind of person to let them steal away his father's crown and scepter, which ought to be his own by right of inheritance. Thus these bad-hearted nephews of King Aegeus, who were the own cousins of Theseus, at once became his enemies. The still more dangerous enemy was Medea, the wicked enchantress, for she was now the king's wife, and wanted to give the kingdom to her son Medus, instead of letting it be given to the son of Aethra, whom she hated. It just so happened that the king's nephews met Theseus, and found out who he was just as he reached the entrance of the royal palace. With all their evil designs against him, they pretended to be their cousin's best friends, and expressed great joy at making his acquaintance. They proposed to him that he should come into the king's presence as a stranger, in order to try whether Aegeus would discover in the young man's features any likeness either to himself or his mother Aethra, and thus recognize him for a son. Theseus consented, for he fancied that his father would know him in a moment by the love that was in his heart. But while he waited at the door, the nephews ran and told King Aegeus that a young man had arrived in Athens, who, to their certain knowledge, intended to put him to death and get possession of his royal crown. "'And he is now waiting for admission to your majesty's presence,' added they. "'Aha!' cried the old king, on hearing this. "'Why, he must be a very wicked young fellow indeed. "'Pray, what would you advise me to do with him?' "'In reply to this question, the wicked Medea put in her word. "'As I have already told you, she was a famous enchantress. "'According to some stories, she was in the habit of boiling old people in a large cauldron, under pretense of making them young again. But King Aegeus, I suppose, did not fancy such an uncomfortable way of growing young, 
or perhaps was contented to be old, and therefore would never let himself be popped into the cauldron. If there were time to spare from more important matters, I should be glad to tell you of Medea's fiery chariot, drawn by winged dragons, in which the enchantress often used to take an airing among the clouds. This chariot, in fact, was the vehicle that first brought her to Athens, where she had done nothing but mischief ever since her arrival. But these and many other wonders must be left untold, and it is enough to say that Medea, amongst a thousand other bad things, knew how to prepare a poison that was instantly fatal to whomsoever might so much as touch it with his lips. So when the king asked what he should do with Theseus, this naughty woman had an answer ready at her tongue's end. "'Leave that to me, please, your majesty,' she replied. "'Only admit this evil-minded young man to your presence, treat him civilly, and invite him to drink a goblet of wine. Your majesty is well aware that I sometimes amuse myself by distilling very powerful medicines. Here is one of them in this small phial. As to what it is made of, that is one of my secrets of state. Do but let me put a single drop into the goblet, and let the young man taste it and I will answer for it. He shall quite lay aside the bad designs with which he comes hither. As she said this, Medea smiled, but for all her smiling face she meant nothing less than to poison the poor innocent Theseus before his father's eyes. And King Aegeus, like most other kings, thought any punishment mild enough for a person who was accused of plotting against his life. He therefore made little or no objection to Medea's scheme, and as soon as the poisonous wine was ready, gave orders that the young stranger should be admitted into his presence. The goblet was set on a table beside the king's throne, and a fly, meaning just to sip a little from the brim, immediately tumbled into it, dead. Observing this, Medea looked round at the nephews, and smiled again. When Theseus was ushered into the royal apartment, the only subject that he seemed to behold was the white-bearded old king. There he sat on his magnificent throne, a dazzling crown on his head and a scepter in his hand. His aspect was stately and majestic, although his years and infirmities weighed heavily upon him, as if each year were a lump of lead, and each infirmity a ponderous stone, and all were bundled up together and laid upon his weary shoulders. The tears both of joy and sorrow sprang into the young man's eyes, for he thought how sad it was to see his dear father so infirm, and how sweet it would be to support him with his own youthful strength, and to cheer him up with the alacrity of his loving spirit. When a son takes a father into his warm heart, it renews the old man's youth in a better way than by the heat of Medea's magic cauldron. And this was what Theseus resolved to do. He could scarcely wait to see whether King Aegeus would recognize him, so eager was he to throw himself into his arms. Advancing to the foot of the throne, he attempted to make a little speech which he had been thinking about as he came up the stairs. But he was almost choked by a great many tender feelings that gushed out of his heart and swelled into his throat, all struggling to find utterance together. And therefore, Unless he could have laid his full, overbrimming heart into the king's hand, poor Theseus knew not what to do or say. The cunning Medea observed what was passing in the young man's mind. She was more wicked at that moment than ever she had been before, for, and it makes me tremble to tell you of it, she did her worst to turn all this unspeakable love with which Theseus was agitated to his own ruin and destruction. "'Does your majesty see his confusion?' she whispered in the king's ear. "'He is so conscious of guilt that he trembles and cannot speak. "'The wretch lives too long. Quick, offer him the wine.' "'Now King Aegeus had been gazing earnestly at the young stranger as he drew near the throne. "'There was something he knew not what, either in his white brow or in the fine expression of his mouth,' or in his beautiful and tender eyes, that made him indistinctly feel as if he had seen this youth before, as if, indeed, he had trotted him on his knee when a baby, and had beheld him growing to be a stalwart man, while he himself grew old. But Medea guessed how the king felt, and would not suffer him to yield to these natural sensibilities, 
although they were the voice of his deepest heart, telling him as plainly as it could speak, that here was our dear son, and Aethra's son, coming to claim him for a father. The enchantress again whispered in the king's ear, and compelled him by her witchcraft to see everything under a false aspect. He made up his mind, therefore, to let Theseus drink off the poisoned wine. End of Part 1 of The Minotaur Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman